Praise the Lord. You guys, uh, you guys ready for one more shot of this? <laughs> one more shot of it? Uh, we have been in a, a series on uh, relationships and marriage and uh, male-female stuff. And today will be our last day in it, uh, barring the Lord, you know, giving me some kind of intense instruction about carrying on and moving on with this. And, you know, it's always a great thing. We, one of the, the passages that we've used, let me just put it up here so you can see it again. I know you have it memorized because I've used it every uh, service with not wrong, just different. It's the, really the, it's just a thought to, to kind of get us started. And, and, and in Proverbs, the scripture says, through wisdom, a house is built and by understanding it's established. And that's not just a little cute proverb saying there. That's what that is saying to us is that if we want to have a great life in relationships, we're going to have to seek wisdom from God. Yeah. And we're going to have to understand some things. And by understanding, it means that uh, I'm informed of some things. I notice them. I, I, I realize these things. I listen to them. And then I put them in practice and and use them, and, and, and God has principles, and God has strategies, and God has procedures and understandings that help us have great relationships. I know that we have a tendency to look at people with long-time relationships or that appear to be wonderful and great and, and all of that, and you say, man, I, I want a relationship like that. That would be awesome. If I, whoo, if I could just, you know, if we could just have that kind of relationship, I would be blessed well, you, and you look at that relationship and you think that somehow it just magically happened like that. You know, we use a phrase, soulmates. And, and I'm not against using the phrase soulmate, but, but I'm just saying that that's not magic, all right? Even if you have a soulmate and somebody that is dynamically, perfectly suited, you prayed, God gave them to you, you get, they gave you to them, and everything is as it should be, still, you're going to have to work on this relationship because men and women are different in all kinds of ways, and God designed us to be different. And so he says, let me, uh, let me, I mean, he gave us a manual that said, here's a manual, it was called, we call it a Bible. Uh, this is a manual about relationships and about how to have them and what to know about them and how to deal with them and how they're going to be blessed. And so he tells us here in Proverbs, uh, look, make no mistake about it. If you're going to have great relationships, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to, to learn some things. And then you're going to have to practice those things. And you're going, to have to, you're going to have to ask God to give you wisdom about those things and understand how your marriage operates. And so uh, that's what I, I want to help us do today, if I possibly can, is to help gain some wisdom about these relationships and about what God has for us in, in marriage because there are some very predictable stages that relationships go through. You know, I've spent three weeks talking about how we are not wrong, we're just different, and God created us different by design, and we learned that we communicate differently, our goals are different, our relationships are different, uh, we're different in the area of romantic fulfillment, physically we're different, uh, spiritual receptivity we're different, and we need even different things from each other. Uh, women need to be loved, and men need to be respected. I mean, it's just a lot of differences, and a lot, well... In just the same way, there are some stages that all relationships go through. And if we can learn something about these stages, then I think it'll be blessed and, and, and give us a, a, an understanding of, uh, of having a better life and a, and, and, a better, and a better marriage. About four, I look back in my records, about four years ago, I know it doesn't seem like that long for some of you, but for about four years ago, I went through the stages of marriage and, um, and tried to help you kind of get a gra grasp on this thing of the different stages that relationships go through because sometimes it can be helpful to know that you're not the only one that might be having some kind of issue going on at some relationship that you thought was the most wonderful thing in the world. And it's just a matter of the fact that uh, as, as our love grows, it, it, it changes. And, and I think you all are wise enough to know this, to know that that love that you began with for Pastor Tanya and I, 41, well, actually 44 years ago, we started dating and, you know, we, we, we dated for three years because uh, we were so young that uh, we couldn't, make, couldn't get a job and make a living and have a place to live. 
So we dated, and then we, but we've been married for 41 years. Well, uh, you, you obviously know, and I know you're, you're mature and, and wise enough to understand that uh, our relationship has changed over 41 years. The, the love, the type of love that we begin with is not the type of love that we have now. And all relationships are going to, to do this. They're going to change. So let's look at the first stage of relationships, and when you, I'm just going to call it the happy honeymoon. Uh, first stage of relationships is that we call we are we're we are thrilled we are excited the the key word for happy honeymoon would be it's thrilling you know and everything is intense and it's just wonderful uh, you would not be surprised to know that uh, the Song of Solomon is a book about honeymoon type of love right and we've looked at the Song of Solomon in several verses to experience, show the difference in romantic fulfillment between men and women. But let me just use a couple of other verses here to show you uh, the happy honeymoon uh, stage of life. Look, look at this. Uh, this is the woman speak. I mean, this is Solomon speaking first about, about, his, about his, uh, his wife. Uh, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Now, that's, that, you can feel the romance dripping out of that, right? You can feel you can feel the the, the juiciness just just kind of just dripping from that. I mean, he is he is uh, he's enraptured here. Now, notice how she speaks in the following verse: "Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love." He just basically say, that's a beautifully poetic line, and I know some of you have heard that line, and it is a beautifully, beautifully poetic line, but it just simply means that he brought me to the place where his family meets and showed me off because he loves me so much, basically is what that's saying. Sustain me with cakes of raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. So he's not far behind, right? She's not far behind. Well, let me show you this one other verse and ask you, uh, this is her speaking still now and saying, the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains and skipping upon the hills. And I just want to ask you ladies that have been married uh, for a pretty good length of time, does that pretty much describe how you see your man? <laughs> leaping upon the mountains and skipping on the, <laughs> on the hill? No, no, it's probably uh, resting in the recliner and snoring on the couch. Uh, <laughs> Just want you to see, you know, <laughs> this is romantic love. This is happy honeymoon, and, and, and this, uh, this stage is marked by certain characteristics, and I'm going to give you five words that would describe the, the happy honeymoon stage of life. The first word will be the word intensity. Uh, the happy honeymoon is intense, uh, focused attention. Uh, they're spellbound. I mean, this is... This is People that are totally engrossed with each other. Uh, there was a song, and, and, and I, if I can remember it, it says, uh, I only have eyes for you. And then it goes, shawapa <laughs> You know, you guys remember the shawapa wop? Shawapa From the what? That's the late 50s? That, 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 that's the intensity. You know, you are the center of my life. You are the center of my world. Uh, my whole life revolves around you. You are the special one of my life. I, and, and, and so uh, it, it's intense. Here, here's another word, idealism. By idealism, I'm, I, I'm saying that uh, we have the tendency in this first stage to put our, put our partner on a pedestal. And, uh, and, 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 to, and, to, and to look at them in, in, in their best ways, in, in their best manner. Uh, the, these, this is out of chapter 4 of Song of Solomon. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, you've seen some of these verses before, but, but it just gives you an idea of this idealism that we look at each other with. I mean, we, you're so special. You're so wonderful. You are the greatest thing. You don't have any warts, blemishes, spots, wrinkles, or anything. You are wonderful. Look at what it says. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. He's talk this is Solomon talking about, his, about the love of his life. Uh, you have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. I, I've told you that means something good, all right? Going down from Mount Gilead, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. In other words, they're, 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 they're white and they're, they're even with each other. 
uh, uh, which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins. I mean, they're symmetrical. You know, she doesn't need braces. They, they're nice. And none of them, and none is barren among them. That means she doesn't have any teeth missing. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is, this is wonderful. This is a, li your lips are like a strand of scarlet and your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the tower of David built for an army on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Hey, baby, this is romance at its best, right? <laughs> How many, <laughs> how many guys, yeah, you see it? I mean, there is a, there, there, there's just a total disregard for, for differences and faults. You, you only see the best. You only see the loveliest. You, you're just enraptured with this wonderful uh, idealistic view of the person and your life and all of those. All right, here's a third word, indulgence. Indulgence, a lot of giving in, a lot of giving up. Well, whatever you want, darling. Oh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, just uh, whatever you like. A lot of catering. A lot of, a lot of pampering a lot of, of each other. Yeah, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of yesing. She can't stand sports. She doesn't know a soccer ball from a basketball. But you love it, and she goes with you because she just can't stand to be without you for a moment. Oh, so wonderful. She'll watch you play games and cheer for you and root for you, even though she doesn't have any idea what's going on. You hate to go to the mall. You hate to shop. But you'll go with her because you, you can't stand to be separated from her for that long. She's just wonderful. These are all words that I know some of you are having trouble remembering this. Uh, I, can, I can see the confusion on your face like... Uh, Pastor, are you sure you're describing? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember all of that. But so, 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 uh, so you, have, you have intensity and idealism and indulgence. And here's a, a fourth word that really just naturally kind of comes from intensity and, uh, and, uh, and idealism and, uh, and, um, and indulgences, and that is infatuation. Uh, we could call infatuation extreme happiness. Let's just, let's just call it that. We, we have idealism, we have, a, uh, we have intensity, we have indulgence, and then you get infatuation and, and you're, you're just high. You, you know, you're, you're in love. Everything seems great. The world's great. She's great. Uh, I'm great. We're great. Uh, all God's children are great. You know, I mean, you're great, great. Everything is, is, is wonderful. And you have a bounce in your step and a gleam in your eye. And, you know, you're whistling as you walk. And everything is wonderful. And, 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 and all of life is great for you. This is stage one. Let me give you another word. Ignorance. Intensity, infatuation, idealism, and indulgence leads naturally to uh, the fact that you don't really know that person. Uh, you've, you're in love with the ideal of them. Uh, you're in love with that beautiful, wonderful, idealistic, uh, infatuated, indulging uh, uh, view of them. And there are two things that you really don't know. One is you don't know what they're really like, and you don't know what you're in for uh, in this relationship. Uh, because in the first stage, we have this tendency to overlook our differences and ignore our faults and put our hang-ups on hold. And any major conflicts we have just get swept under the rug. But this stage doesn't last, does it? It, it can't last, right? Because it's filled with... Uh, unrealistic things. It's filled with things that can't, that can't continue. You, sooner or later, you're going to wake up and find out that, that they do have spots. Uh, they do need to brush their teeth. They're, you know, they have warts and blemishes, and, 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 and they're not as perfect as you thought they were because there's just no way for this type of uh, idealistic type of, of love to continue in life, and so stage one just kind of naturally floats off to the side, and we enter stage two of relationships. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, let me read this to you because this is, you'll like this. This is something you need to see. This is Proverbs 27. I want to just remind you, and I'm going to read it, and I know you're reading it right now, but I just want to remind you that the same person 
who wrote the Song of Solomon that we just read, also wrote Proverbs 27. Now, notice what happens here. A continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Uh, something's changed, right? <laughs> right? Whoever, look, whoever restrains her restrains the wind and grasps oil with the right hand. Have you ever pick, tried to pick up a drop of oil? Uh, it's all, <laughs> can't do it, really. And, and, and so what I'm saying is something has noticeably changed here, right? All right, so what has changed? Well, we have moved from stage one, the happy honeymoon stage of love and relationships, to stage two, in which I'm just going to call it the party's over. Um, and, and I want you to, to notice the change in attitude between uh, stage one and stage two. You know, delight in stage one turns to disillusionment in stage two. Dating in stage one turns to debating in stage two. Uh, romance in stage one turns to resentment in stage two. And what was ideal in stage one becomes an ordeal in stage two. And this is the natural progression of relationships because... Um, as we get to know each other, as we live with each other, as we see each other, as we wake up with each other, as we uh, go through our daily life, as we come home to each other, as we sit around at night with each other, as, as life moves on, there are certain things that we begin to grasp that weren't true in stage one. Let me give you five words that identify stage two. Stage two, the first word would be dullness. Uh, it's back to the routine. Uh, boredom sets in. Uh, we become complacent. We, we lose interest. Um, uh, it affects all the areas of our, uh, of our relationship, but let me just give you two of them so you see what I'm talking about. Um, in the area of attractiveness, just say. Uh, when you're in stage one, you're always at your best. You, 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 put, your, you put your makeup on. Uh, guys, you comb your hair if you have, curse to have any in you. And you're... Um, <laughs> And you, and, you, and you wear a, a nice T-shirt, and, you, and you're presentable, and you present yourself in a nice way. And you wouldn't dare let this other person see you in, in, in any unkept manner whatsoever. Uh, how many of you have ever, I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but, but you, you've ever had uh, the, the stage one love person that, in your life just show up at your home or somewhere where you were that you didn't know they were going to show up and, and, and catch you in some less than idealistic presentation of yourself. I mean, have, has he ever just knocked on the door when you didn't think he was going to come? And you're in there in the house and you got your sweatpants on and your old sloppy T-shirt and your hair's not gone. You got your glasses on or whatever. And, and, uh, and man, it's like he knocks on the door and you look out that little peep hole and it's him. It's like, <laughs> and it's, you know, and here we go. And it's throwing and running and, you know. Uh, and guys, you, you, you know, you're, you're in a very similar type vein. You know, you just, you, you just don't, you just want to be at your best and, and, because ooh, she, you love her, she's so wonderful, and, and everything's great and wonderful, and ooh, yeah. and uh, and now when we get to stage two, we've got a little complacency going on here, and people begin to uh, uh, not care as much about the way you look. Uh, you let yourself look like something the cats drug in and the dog wouldn't drag back out. Right? You look like something somebody wouldn't take to a worm wrestle. I mean, before, you know, it was, it was oh, I've got to be presentable. And before it was, you know, I've got the best. But now you've slipped and you've, and you've, you've become complacent about your appearance. Dullness has set in. Uh, another area is your, is your attitude. You know, before, when you were dating in stage one, you were... Relating in stage one, everything was whatever you want, darling. Oh, you want to go that good? Let's do that. We haven't been there in a long time. Here, come. You open the door for her to get in. The chariot awaits. Come on. And you sweep them off, and then you go, and you sit down in a restaurant, and you sit across the table, and you hold hands, and you look at each other's eyes, and you're talking about your dreams, and your passions, and your feelings, and, and you're, oh, you look so beautiful tonight. Oh, yeah, that's just a, I mean, you're all into that, and now your attitude changes somewhat in stage two, right? It kind of gets a little more surly. It gets a, gets a little looser and. uh 
You did it yourself. <laughs> Are your arms broke? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you want a hot meal, you better set your cornflakes on fire. <laughs> Just a general dullness takes over in life. Everybody say, stage two. Stage two. Okay, stage two. You didn't get any, we don't have any milk. No, you'll have to go to the store yourself, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's totally uh, relaxed, and, and, and you begin to become more of uh, who you really are, and they begin to see the, door, the, the warts, the spots, the wrinkles, and all of those kind of things. Here's the second word, disagreement. Uh, you begin to have some strife in your relationship, some divisions, some, some arguments, those things that were once overlooked now have come out of the woodwork. And, 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 and you look at your maid and, and you say, I want to ask two questions. And one is, uh, who are you and what did you do with my wonderful honey? You know, I mean, yeah, this disagreement pops in. Here's a third word, defensiveness. Yeah, we become defensive because we learn that to protect ourselves because now we've learned that we can't be as open as we used to because uh, something might be used against me. You know, I might say something. I need to watch what I say. I need to watch how I say it. And communication begins to break down because uh, you don't want your faults to be, to be exposed because uh, they never forget somehow some of these things. And so we begin to do two things. We begin to excuse ourselves and we begin to accuse the other. And, and, and we start finding faults and we start magnifying those faults and we get very defensive in our own, in our own life. Here's a fourth word, disapproval. Before, in the Song of Solomon, Solomon said, everything she does is right. And now, in Proverbs, he says, she can't do anything right. Quite a change, right? Yeah. yeah. A, lot of, a lot of nagging, a lot of criticizing, a lot of, a lot of complaining. Like the wife who said, uh, I knew when I married my husband, he was temperamental. I didn't know that meant 90% temper and 10% mental. <laughs> Husbands get defensive and, 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 and disapproval begins to come and... and, and Lots of lots of hidden uh, disapproval. Uh, do you know, guys? You guys know that sixty-five percent of communication is nonverbal. Do you know this? I mean, really, most of what what we say to each other, we say it with a look, or a lilt, or a body language, maybe even a tone in in your voice is sarcastic. You know, we, we say things to each other, and we imply things to each other, and we, and we, and we, we look, and we, mm, mm, you know, and our, our face tell the story about all of those kind of things, and, and instead of being wonderful and great, and, you know, you're so awesome, and you're so beautiful, and you're so wonderful, now you're like a dripping drip in a rainy day. <laughs> Can't you just quit for a minute, you know? A dripping drip on a dripping day. Yeah, continual drip. Can't please you. Pleasing you would be like picking up a drop of oil with your finger. Can't happen. Well, these are stage two issues, and, and we began to disapprove each other, and of course it, it goes into now disappointment. Uh, you've become disillusioned, and, and, and I, I've heard people say... Uh, I feel cheated. I, I'm, I, 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 I'm trapped in this situation, and, and doubts begin to fly in. This, this is the stage where you begin to say, you begin to ask yourself, did I do the right thing? Did, did I marry the right person? I should have prayed more about this. Is this in God's will? Is this God's person for me? Because you, you, you have now become disappointed to the extent where you're even questioning whether this relationship should even be or not. 
This is stage two. This is what happens in stage two. And, and, and if they're not uh, some changes, one of two things is going to happen. These two big Ds, divorce or depression. Yeah, if something doesn't come in to make a difference in this relationship, uh, you're, you're, you're set on a direction that's going to end in either a divorce, which, by the way, I know nobody really likes to think of statistics like this, but in America, in America, marriages last generally a little bit less than seven years. And about 50% of marriages end in divorce. And if you're on your second marriage, the statistics are even greater that it'll end in divorce and third and fourth and so forth. Unless, unless some kind of something changes this, this, this conclusion in life. So you end up in stage two, either ending it and, and dumping the bum and walking away or deciding that you're going to have to endure it for the rest of your life and I can never be happy again. I'm just going to have to settle for being miserable and, and I'll, just, I'll just make it through and, and, and we'll just go on together. So what is it that can change stage two and alter so that, that in stage one it was like you make me feel so so glad and in stage two you make me feel so bad so what do we do what, what what's happening here well in my pastoring experience i've learned that at this particular point that either one of three things happens either you have a breakup or you have a breakdown or you have a breakthrough. God wants you to have a breakthrough. God wants you to make it through stage two. And all relationships go through stage two. And I know some of you say, oh, our wonderful relationship didn't go through stage. Well, you're probably still in stage one, you know. Because all relationships go through this uh, this time where we discover and we're disillusioned and disappointed and we're desperate for for what is wrong and how can we change this and what do we do. So let me talk to you about what God says about love in stage three. We call, I call it patient in love because it really describes the, the deepening and the, the truth of a love relationship that can last forever. And I'm going to, of course, obviously go to 1 Corinthians 3 because chapter 13, I mean, 1 Corinthians 13, because chapter 13 is all about this kind of love. If you want to read, there are 16 descriptions in 1 Corinthians 13, and all of those 16 descriptions are about love and tell us exactly how a great love is supposed to be. So let me just read a few of them, and, and, and let's look at this. Love suffers long and is kind. It does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. It ends with verse 13 where it says, And now... These three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So God is describing a relationship, a love relationship that can endure our lives together, can, can move us to, from, a, from a, a genuinely infatuated, idealistic, uh, phony, fake kind of love which all of us are attracted by. I mean, God gives us this stage one type of love so that we'll be attracted to each other I mean, so that we'll want to be with each other. But that's not intended to last, and it can't last, and it won't last. And so there, are, there have to be some adjustments made. There has to be some understanding that's come to. There has to be some, 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 some practice that changes. We have to... We have to, uh, we have to, we have to uh, understand and, and do these things. These things don't just happen in life. Listen, I promise you that no one that you look at with a great relationship and you say, gosh, man, I wish I could have a marriage like that, that none of them just had that relationship happen to them. 
They've been through stage two, seriously. Now, they may not have lasted long in stage two, and they may have made, may have made quick adjustments, but everybody has to work on these things. And so what kind of things would we want to work on? All right, I, in your notes, I've, I've given you a place for an acrostic, and the acrostic is going to be the word trust. All right, we're gonna we're gonna use, we're gonna we're gonna give I'm gonna give you some understanding that will spell out the word trust, because that's what's really involved with 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 great lasting love relationships. Let me give you the first. The T. The first T is the word tenderness. Tenderness. I am to be gentle, not judgmental with each other. To be tender means that 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 I'm I'm careful. I'm careful with your feelings. I'm careful with your ego. I'm careful with the way I talk to you and I handle you and I deal with you. You know, one of the things that I think makes this a great church, and I, I, I really believe this about us, I've pastored eight churches in my 43 years of ministry. I've pastored small churches. I've pastored large churches, city churches, rural churches, family churches. I pastored eight churches. And I can say to you that this church is the most unique group of people that I have ever pastored in my life. You are the easiest to pastor. You are the, you are the kindest, nicest, most gentle people with each other that I've ever been around. And, and, and I'm serious, and, and, and Bev and I, cause, and Lawrence, we've been together from the very start, and we've been in some other situations, and, and Tanya, and of course, Tanya and I, and, and Justin, and all, everybody that's been with us in, for all these years, we talk about this. And I'm going to tell you why I think that we are this kind of church, because we are tender with each other. We respect each other's feelings. We don't want to demand our own rights and hurt you by demanding. And, and by this, I'm talking about we are living in our country in an age right now that is the most divisive, angry, hostile environment that I have ever seen. I'm 63 years, right, I'm almost right at 63 years old. And I've never seen it. As, I mean, even the civil rights days of the 60s were not this, were not this, this uh, poisonous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had lots of strife and hippies and, 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 and protesters and, and goofballs and all these crazy groups and stuff back. I mean, our country's been through lots of stuff like that. But we're now, in, in my opinion, in the most toxic environment that we have ever been in as a country. And when I look at this church, and I look at you guys, we are such a broad spectrum of people in here. Races, uh, education levels, uh, families, uh, occupations, uh, you, you name it. We are just a smorgasbord of people. How can we get along with each other? How can we not feel this? I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't feel any of that kind of anger and hostility in here. I, I don't feel any, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not afraid to be around any of you guys and talk to you and be relaxed and be myself and, and hear you and, you, and we, we're together in fellowships and we have all kinds of, of breakfasts and dinners and lunches and prayer meetings. We're, I mean, I have, I have no bonfires. We do, we do all, everything together, going to Bellingrad. I mean, we, in other words, I love to be with you guys. And I don't, and it doesn't make me nervous. Because you know, most likely, some of you know, I have different opinions about things than you do. And you have difference than me. But we don't let that become a problem. We don't, I don't talk about it. Have you, you have noticed this, right? I try very carefully not to bring up buzzwords are, are words that would imply something towards some people's beliefs or thoughts. And we are, I guarantee you we have people sitting right out here. We are so vastly different, it's unbelievable. But I'm going to tell you what. 
What, the way we're different doesn't matter to me. I love you. I want to be your pastor. I want to see you in heaven one day. My, my, my concern is about your spirit and your life and, and, and your destiny, your eternity, eternity. And so that's what matters to me. So I'm not going to do anything to try to ruin that by not being tender with your feelings and saying things that I know are going to be hurtful to you or cause you pain. Now, if you're going to move from stage two to stage three in your relationship with each other, this is the same tenderness that I'm talking about. The weaknesses that you know, the frailties that you know. You know, I've heard people say this a lot. Boy, they know just what button to push. Well, may I say to you that it's not some button they know. It's any button. Because you care what they think. I guarantee you that I could say some of the same things to you that your mate says to you, and you wouldn't react the same. You say, well, they just know the right button. No, I just pushed the same button they pushed. But you don't react that way because you don't care what I think. But you do care what they think. And so in our relationship, T, if we're going to move past, we're going to go forward, tenderness is going to become a word. Here's another. Here's the R. R would be respect and responsibility. You're going to need to develop and, and exhibit a respect for your mate and treat them with respect and appreciation. Now, let me just give you an example of this. Tanya and I decided this, and I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but we decided years and years, I don't even know how many years ago, long, long time ago, that we were going to treat each other with as much respect as we treat perfect strangers in our life. Think about it. You, you treat people you don't even know with respect. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Here, let me help you. Let me open that door for you. I mean, you're, you're respectful. You're kind. I mean, in the South, we have, we're born with filters, right? Now, you northern people, I don't know if you're born with these filters. I know. Now, that's not tender, is it? That's not, no, no. That's not nice. But my experience say that, uh, that Southern people have, have filters that some others may not have. Let's just say that. And, and we're, we have the tendency to be that way. And I'm just saying that, uh, think about that. Think about that. Do you treat the person that you vowed to love, honor, cherish, to have no other person ahead of them in your life? You said, I do at an altar. When somebody asks you that question, do you treat them with as much respect as you treat a perfect stranger in your life? Or are you uh, unkind, arrogant, uh, rude even to the person that loves you, the person that's going to cry at your funeral? I mean, let's just get real, man. I mean, these people that you're so kind and respectful to and patient with and all of that, they don't know you. They... They won't be at your funeral. They won't miss you when you're gone. And this person that loves you, are you respectful to them? That's the ones who are going to miss you when you're gone. That's the one who's going to think about you for the rest of their life. And so we should be respectful and responsible, which means that I accept the responsibility to make this marriage great and that I have some responsibility in this relationship. Uh, by that, I mean it's, it's easy to point a finger and say, well, if you would do this and if you would quit saying that and if you would straighten up, if you would... No, 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 no. Look, I have some responsibility in this relationship. I said I do. And I said I would do this. 
and I would love you and honor you and cherish you and respect you and put you on a pedestal in my life. I said that I would never leave you, never forsake you. I said I would forsake all others and cleave only to you so long as we both shall live. I said those things, and I'm going to be responsible to do what I said I'm going to do, regardless of whether you do what you're supposed to do. Look, you're not responsible for what somebody else does, and you can't fix anybody else. Quit trying to fix people. You can't fix people. You can only do what you are responsible to do, and if you will take accept that responsibility, you have the possibility of moving from stage two to stage three, respect and responsibility. Let me move on. All right, the you. The you would be understanding. The only way to make it to stage three is to understand that, that you're different and accept the fact that we'll never be the same and that we can disagree without falling apart. And I'm the only me that God made. And so I, I'm going to be me and, and I'm going to let you be you. And, 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 and I'm going to quit trying to fix you and quit trying to fix our marriage and fix this relationship and fix our kids and fix this. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to understand that in some ways we're never going to be the same. In some ways we're never going to see things the same way. But that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to love you like Christ loved the church and gave himself and died for it. And ladies, I'm to submit to you like Christ, like, like the church does to Christ, and, and that we're, we're, we're to love each other and God will grow us together and trust God to make the difference. You've heard me say this before, that um, I'm in, I, I, resi I resigned as general manager of the universe. I, there were many years I thought I was the general manager of the universe and that I could fix people. I could fix things. I could make things be different. And I have found out now to my de demise and, and, and the press uh, over the years that I can't fix anything and that I'm not in management, but I'm in sales. And so I don't have any management responsibility, nor can I make any management decisions nor can I do anything that requires management to do. And so if I resign, then I can relax and I can allow God to do what only God can do and pray that God would do. That's right, Bill. Fix and fix issues and changes. I'm not saying that no one needs to be changed or that something doesn't need to be fixed. I'm just saying you can't do it. <laughs> and only God can. And so if I'll be who I'm required to be in this relationship, God can do the work that only God can do. Here is the, here's the fourth word, security, the S in trust, security. Mature love has to have security to make it happen. In other words, we can never be intimate with each other and by intimate, I'm not, you know, when I say that word, I, I think I feel responsible to always say I'm not talking about sex. To be intimate with someone means to be able to see into them. As a matter of fact, I like to define intimacy with the phrase into me see. When I allow you to see into me, we're, we're intimate. And when I see into you, then we have intimacy. Now, without security, and by security I mean a commitment that I am in this for the long haul. I am not about to leave. I'm not going to quit. I love you. I said I will be with you. You can count on me. I'm a man of my word. I'm a woman of my word. I'm a person of integrity. I love you. I know we're going to have some rough spots. I know there are going to be some times where things aren't typical and normal. But don't be afraid I'm going to walk out the door and go get my divorce lawyer and try to get the kids and whatever. I love you, and I'm in this forever. And without that type of security, you can never be intimate with each other because you will never allow someone to see into you if you feel they're about to walk out the door. And in order for your love to develop and grow, you have to have intimacy. As a matter of fact, it's intimacy that causes love to grow. When I see your goals, when I see your dreams, 
when I see the, the visions that you have for your life, when I, when I understand the direction, when I, when, I, when I feel the pains and the hurts and the sorrows, and I, and I, and I know what you're about and where you're going and, and what you want to accomplish in life, and, and, and I get all of this, then that's intimacy, and, and I can love that. And I can support that, and I can help that, and I can walk with that. So there has to be a commitment to this thing, and you have to communicate that to each other, or else there will be no intimacy, because intimacy can't happen if I'm fearful that you're about to walk out the door if something doesn't go just right. Here is the last T, truthfulness. The Bible says that we are to speak the truth in love. That's very difficult to do a lot of times. Uh, Corinthians that we read said that love does not rejoice in iniquity, which is the twisting of, of sin. That word means specifically a twisted kind of sin. Love doesn't rejoice in that. Love rejoices in the truth. Paul says, speak the truth in love, which can be a very difficult thing to do because Sometimes the, a truthful thing is hard to say. It's hard to, it's hard to, to put forth without, without crushing or hurting someone. But what the Bible says is that someone, and, and this is the way we're to be with all of, with everyone, everyone. I mean, I, as your pastor, am to speak, the truth to you in love. That my job is not to, to get a hammer and beat you over the head. My, my job is to, is to speak to you the truth of God, but do it in a way that regards your feelings and your, and your ego and your personality and who you are so that you can receive what I say and, it, and it'll matter to you. I mean, if you want to really uh, talk to people in a way that won't, that won't be productive, just get sarcastic, insulting, uh, degrading, belittling. Do any of that. It won't, it's water on a duck's back. They aren't listening to you. You've made them mad. They're resisting everything you're saying. You probably are pushing them further away. But if you'll be gentle, you'll speak the truth in love, be kind. I mean, the truth sometimes is hard. But you can say it in a kind way. You can, I, I, in, in, in a School of Leaders, in, in one of the terms, I, I give some instruction on some things like this. And, and, and I call it uh, the, 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 rule of, the rule of salt. Uh, Put a little salt on it. Sprinkle a little salt. Everything tastes better with a little salt on it, right? <laughs> some of you salt-free guys, you know, you're going, nah, nah, nah. no, no, you, you want some salt. You know you do. <laughs> Put a little salt on it. Tastes better with a little salt. In other words, before I, before I lay this thing on you, uh, take time to sprinkle a little salt on it. Make it a little more palatable. Make it a little easier, easier to take it in, you know. Make it taste a little better and figure out a way to do that. If you're so smart, you need to figure out a way to do that. That's right. So be, be, be truthful with each other in, in love and tell the truth because life revolves around the truth. Uh, nothing is more destructive than lies. Nobody wants to be lied to. And if, they, if you do lie, you're going to get caught and it's going to be bad. Just tell the truth. Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Yeah, Lawrence tells the truth. When, when you say we're all in the same boat, that means that we all owe each other a terrible trust. Right. We all, you know, we all in that same boat. It's like me and me in the same foxhole. Right. You watch my back and sides and head, and I watch your back, sides and head, too. And right. We owe each other a, a terrible trust. Right. And that is true. Lawrence said, we owe each other a, a terrible trust. That's what he's saying. Uh, we owe each other to, be, to watch our back, to be truthful with each other, to be honest with each other, to be respectful of each other. 
and all of that. And, and, and I, I, I don't want to bring this up again, but I do love to brag on you, and really, and I love for you to know what, I want you to know what I think about you. I really love for you to know that. And, I, and, and just talking about our church, and thank the Lord, I mean, seriously, I thank the Lord that I can use you for an example. I mean, that's just a, I mean, you, you'd be shocked how many churches are supposed to be this way, but they're not at all this way. And, and they can't be used as an example of anything, you know. But you guys, I, I mean, seriously, with each other, with trusting and, 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 and having each other's back and, and caring about each other and uh, exhibiting that and, and knowing that, it's just unbelievable. And you say, I like this place. You say, man, I love to come to church because I just sense a good spirit there. I just, I, it makes me feel better just to walk in that building with those people. And when I'm there and, and everybody's around me, I just, I'm, I feel so comfortable. I feel like I belong there. Uh, it's just such a wonderful environment. I sense a, a, a unity and a closeness and all that. Nobody's jockeying for positions and arguing about all these strife field things and nobody's insulting people and insinuating things and all of that. That's, that's, that, that is what we're talking about. That's the environment that creates stage three love in a relationship. Not because, look, I have the right to say anything I want to say, and so do you. But we, we, we remove that from ourselves because we choose to, because we want to have a relationship. And you are more important to me than my uh, right to say a bunch of stuff. What difference would, does it? it? That doesn't make, make a bit of difference. What makes a difference is eternity, love, truth, uh, together, companionship, relationship. Um, it, that's what matters in life. Yeah. That's right. Because we can do something, Rick said. We don't, doesn't mean we should. And that, it, that's the thought. That's the, that's the thought of tenderness. That's the thought of truthfulness. That's the, that's the, the thought of, of, of growing, of growing in, in love with each other. That's 1 Corinthians 13 stuff is what that's all about. All right, let me give you, let me give you these, three little, these three little survival things, and I don't even think I really need to say anything about them because you guys are, are right there. Open up. Uh, James 5, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The affection, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, it's just a, that's just an encouragement. Okay, if I'm not in stage three, how do I get there? I, I open up. I, I, I'm open. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I say truthful things and, I, and I, I talk about these things and we talk about the issues and real repentance, real forgiveness and all those things. Give up. What do you give up? Well, you give up the ways of overreacting and responding in, 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 with ugly uh, types of attitudes that obviously don't work, uh, ridicule, sarcasm, jabs, digs, over-exaggerations. <laughs> you don't ever have any of those, right? Silent treatment, uh, threatening to leave, blaming. I wrote in my note, you'll never fix the problem if you're trying to fix the blame. So it's not who's, who's at fault. It's just we're going to fix this problem. And we're not going to act this way. We're going to give up some stuff. And that's what we're giving up. And then the last one is grow up. How many times has somebody said that to you? You need to grow up. <laughs> well, it's the truth. We need to, we need to, we need to, we need to grow up. And, and the word that's used for it is maturity. Because there are lots of immature, selfish people that got together before they realized what was happening, but their marriage can't work unless they grow up. In every, in every marriage, it takes give and take. It takes adjustments. It takes change. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes maturity. So accept the responsibility for being a grown-up in this marriage. Don't make, the, your other, don't make your mate be the only person that grows up in this thing. Come on. 
You have a responsibility. All right. I think that's enough of that, right? All right. Yeah, yeah Don. Shut up. <laughs> you the one that's going to get in trouble. I'm, I'm, you are the one that's going to get in trouble. And with that, let's all stand up. How about that? 